بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم we have a double integral involving the data function if we look carefully at the integrand it depends on the product of the two variables x and y in the denominator we have the natural logarithm of x y the arguments of the data function are 1 minus x y over 2 1 plus x y over 2 here we have a double integral on the unit square and the integrand depends only on the product x y our first step is to prove that if we have a double integral like this our function here g of x y can be represented as a function of the product x y this double integral is equal to a single integral the integrand here is this function multiplied by minus the natural logarithm of x the integrand the function g of x and y depends only on the product we will assume that g is a nice function we may for instance assume that g is absolute integrable which according to fubini implies that we can do the integration in any order of our choice we get the same value for the integral if we swap x and y so our integral is double the integral over this half of the square or that other half we can rewrite the double integral as two times the integral now x is from zero to one and if we fix a value for x y is from zero to x let's do the change of variables alpha is equal to x y eta is equal to x plus y alpha is the product eta is the sum from here we have that y is equal to alpha over x replacing y here by alpha over x we get the equation that x minus eta plus alpha over x is equal to zero multiplying both sides by x we get x squared minus eta x plus alpha equal to zero there are two solutions to this quadratic equation the solution with the plus sign is x and with the minus sign is y because in the domain of integration y is less than x we need to write the area element in terms of the new variables alpha and eta dx dy is d eta d alpha we need to divide by the jacobian of alpha and eta with respect to x and y the partial derivative of alpha with respect to x is y the partial derivative of alpha with respect to y is x the partial derivative of eta with respect to x is one and with respect to y is one the absolute determinant is x minus y as we can see from here x minus y is this square root this part here is replaced by d eta d alpha divided by the square root eta squared minus 4 alpha h of x y becomes h of alpha what about the limits of integration if we multiply two real numbers between 0 and 1, we get a result between 0 and 1. So let's have our outer integral with respect to alpha, and alpha is between 0 and 1. What are the lower and upper limits for eta? By the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality, we know that x plus y over 2 is greater than or equal to the square root of xy. That is, eta is greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of alpha. We can also see this from this inequality, that x plus y squared is greater than or equal to 4xy, because this is equivalent to x minus y squared greater than or equal to zero what is the upper bound of eta we may say that the upper bound is equal to two because the maximum value of x is one the maximum value of y is one so eta cannot exceed two but we actually have a sharper upper bound that explicitly depends on alpha the idea here is that x is living between zero and one y is between zero and one one minus x times one minus y is greater than or equal to zero because this is the product of non-negative quantities if we expand we have one minus x minus y plus xy is greater than or equal to zero. Moving these two terms to the right-hand side, we get that one plus xy is greater than or equal to x plus y. So we have the inequality that one plus alpha is greater than or equal to eta. The integral with respect to eta is from two, the square root of alpha, all the way to alpha plus one. Let's carry out the integration with respect to eta. Generally, if we have the integral of one over the square root of x squared minus c dx, we can do the substitution x equal to the square root of c times the secant of t cosine t is a square root c divided by x sine t dt is square root c over x squared dx so dx is x squared over square root c sine t dt x squared is c sec t squared multiplied by sine t dt the integrand here is one over the square root of c sec t squared minus one is tan t squared we have this factor one over the square root of c this is the cotangent of t then we have the square root of c times this function of t cotangent of t is cosine t over sine t after eliminating the square root of c we get the integral of the secant of t which is the natural logarithm of the tangent of t plus the secant of t rewriting our result in terms of the variable x we get that this integral here is the natural logarithm of x divided by the square root of c between brackets we have one plus the square root of one minus c over x squared let's go back to our integral with respect to eta the value that we get is this result here x is replaced by eta and c is replaced by four alpha using the limits of integration and simplifying we get minus one half ln alpha. This one half cancels this two. We end up with this nice result that the double integral is minus the integral alpha from zero to one ln alpha times h of alpha.
let's go back to our main task. This double integral here can be written as minus the integral alpha from 0 to 1. We have this integrand where xy is replaced by alpha. We have an extra len alpha. These guys go away. We can write down the beta function in terms of the gamma function. Gamma of 1 minus alpha over 2 times gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2. Downstairs, we have gamma of the sum, and the sum is equal to 2. Gamma of 2 is 1 factorial. That's 1. For the gamma function, gamma of 1 plus z is equal to z gamma of z. Applying this to gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2, we get alpha over 2 times gamma alpha over 2. Then we use the reflection formula for the gamma function. We have gamma of z times gamma of 1 minus z is equal to pi over sine by z. This product of gamma functions can be written as pi divided by sine pi. In place of z, we use alpha over 2. If we do the change of variables, theta equal to pi alpha over 2, we get sine theta downstairs. In the numerator, we have theta. The integral is multiplied by minus 2 over pi. Using the substitution, z equal to 10 theta over 2. When theta is 0, z is 0. When theta is pi over 2, z is 10 pi over 4, which is 1. Theta is 2 times the inverse tangent of z. Sine theta over 2 is equal to z over the square root of 1 plus z squared. Cosine theta over 2 is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 plus z squared. Sine theta is 2 times sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2. We get 2z over 1 plus z squared. Since z is equal to 10 theta over 2, d theta is equal to 2 cosine squared theta over 2 dz. d theta is replaced by 2 dz divided by 1 plus z squared. This 2 goes with that 2. This 2 can be taken outside. Now we have to integrate z from 0 to 1, the inverse tangent of z divided by z. If we use the Taylor series for the inverse tangent function, we can write down this inverse tangent function as summation n from 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, z to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1. The inverse tangent is multiplied by 1 over z. So we have the integral from 0 to 1, summation n from 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, over 2n plus 1, z to the power 2n. If we integrate term by term, the integral is applied to this z to the 2n. When we integrate from 0 to 1, we get 1 over 2n plus 1, which is multiplied by this term here to give us 2n plus 1 squared. This summation here is 1 over 1 squared, minus 1 over 3 squared, plus 1 over 5 squared, minus 1 over 7 squared, and so on. This is Catalan's constant, denoted here by big G. It is multiplied by this constant here. Our double integral is equal to minus 4 times Catalan's constant divided by pi.